On April 6, 1994, at around 8.15 p.m., a rocket attack brought down a plane carrying President Juvenal Habyarimana of Rwanda and President Cyprian Tayamira of Burundi. The aircraft was shot down as it was about to land in Kigali, Rwanda's capital city. Other notable officers and several French troops would also lose their lives in the crash. As a matter of fact, everyone aboard the plane was killed. The deaths of Habyarimana and Tayamira would lead to a Rwandan genocide the next day. In this episode, we shall tell you about Juvenal Habyarimana, who killed him and how his death led to the Rwandan genocide. Juvenal Habyarimana was the second president of post-independent Rwanda. He was in the military and grew through the ranks to become the country's minister of defense under President Gregoire Kiyanda's administration. Habyarimana had overthrown his predecessor in a coup to become president and he ruled for 21 years. His prolonged administration was laden with electoral fraud which was believed to have led to his running uncontested three consecutive times for the Rwandan presidential elections. On March 8, 1937, the wealthy Habyarimana family welcomed a baby boy who would eventually grow up to lead their country. After his primary education at a Catholic school, Habyarimana went to the College of St. Paul in Congo, graduating with a degree in mathematics and humanities. He later enrolled in medical school at the Lovanium University in Leopoldville. When the Rwandan Revolution began in 1959, Habyarimana left medical school to enroll in the officer's training school in Kigali. He excelled, graduating with distinction in 1961 and becoming an aide to a Belgian commander. During this time, he married his wife, Agatha Kanziga. By 1963, Habyarimana was already a lieutenant and was promoted to head of the Rwandan National Guard. In 1965, he became the Minister of the National Guard and Police, but Habyarimana wasn't done climbing the ladders of power yet. In 1973, Juvenal Habyarimana was made the Army Chief of Staff and Minister of Defense. While occupying this position, he successfully led a coup deposing his boss, President Gregoire Kiyanda of the Famehutu Party. After two years in power as president, Habyarimana formed the National Revolutionary Movement for Development, MRND Party, declaring it the only legally recognized party in the country. He ruled as a military president until 1978 when he was re-elected as president for a five-year term with the emergence of a new constitution. The MRND remained the only legal political party and Habyarimana was the only candidate to contest. <music> Juvenal Habyarimana led a dictatorship government and being of the Hutu tribe, he passed many policies that favored his tribe and were antagonistic to the Tutsis. He operated under the MRND party, the only party during his tenure, making Rwanda a totalitarian state. So extreme was his dictatorship that the masses were required to chant and dance to his praises at political gatherings. Although he ran unopposed in his re-elections, rebel forces comprising mostly of the Tutsi tribe under the name Rwanda People's Front RPF, fought against his government. This resulted in the Rwandan Civil War which began in 1990 and lasted until 1994. When Juvenal Habyarimana became president, unlike his predecessor, he initially refused to implement policies that favored only the Hutus, but this did not last for long. He eventually continued running an administration of favoritism to the Hutus as quotas for choice jobs and academic slots were reserved for them. At some point, Habyarimana began to favor only people from the Jisei region, his hometown, and his inner kakos of friends and family. As a result of this, disgruntled Hutu groups began opposing Habyarimana's government. 
these minority groups began working in a coalition with Tutsi tribe members to end the regime. In 1990, after much pressure from the country's major financial sponsors, the International Monetary Fund, France and the World Bank, Habarimana allowed the formation of other political parties besides the MRND. Some of these parties were the Republican Democratic Movement, the Social Democratic Party, the Liberal Party and the Christian Democratic Party. The formation of these parties, however, did not deter the rebellious forces of the Rwandan People's Front from carrying out attacks on his government. Although the RPF failed to overthrow Habyarimana during their many attacks, a peace accord was signed in 1992. Peace negotiations, which lasted about four months, led to Habyarimana's signing of the Arusha Accords. The Arusha Accords made provisions for a power-sharing government between the Rwandan Patriotic Front and the Habyarimana government. This was a huge turn-off for Hutu extremists, and despite the Arusha Accords, the unrest within the country continued and escalated by 1994. Habyarimana had been nicknamed Kinani, meaning invincible, Yet, it had been slightly over two decades of ruling Rwanda single-handedly and nothing had been done to calm the lasting tensions between the two tribes, Hutus and Tutsis. Thousands of Tutsis who had been living in neighboring countries as refugees were still not allowed to come back and this led to growing grievances. During the ongoing peace talks and reforms to uphold the Arusha Accords, President Habyarimana had gone to Tanzania for a meeting. While returning to his country with the president of Burundi, Cypren Tayamira, and other government officials from both countries, his plane was shot down. All occupants of the presidential private jets died. This occurrence would set off for the next 99 days the Rwandan genocide, which claimed the lives of about 800,000 Rwandans. In neighboring Burundi, before the Arusha records were assigned, the Hutu and Tutsi conflict was already ongoing. Members of the Tutsi tribe were alleged to have killed Burundian president Melchior Ndadaye, who was Hutu, a few months after his election. The assassination exploded into a full-blown massacre as thousands of Hutus and Tutsi Burundians were killed. This confirmed the fears of the Hutu extremists in Rwanda who believed the power-sharing accord signed by President Habyarimana would not be upheld. The atmosphere in the sophisticated airborne craft was calm and amiable. The Dassault Falcon 50 had its interiors designed for royalty and suited for its passengers. The jet, headed for the Kigali International Airport in Rwanda, had on board the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi, as well as other high-ranking government officials from both countries and crew members totaling about 12 people. Sounds of light conversational chatter transformed swiftly into gasps of shock and surprise as a whizzing sound too loud to be ignored got closer. There was no time to brace for impact as the jet burst into flames after collision with the rocket missiles. There were no survivors and this was no accident. The president of Rwanda and Burundi had just been assassinated. Shortly after the news of President Juvenal Habyarimana's assassination spread, the attacks started. Right from the corridors of power, Colonel Theonest Bagusara, the cabinet chief, led the presidential guard to begin executing government officials who were Tutsis, mixed tribes and moderate Hutus. The RPF on the other hand began implementing retaliatory attacks on the Rwandan army. The genocide was already on the way. United Nations troops who were sent in to uphold the peace accord began evacuating after a few hours. Appeals were made to the foreigners residing within the country to remain with the hopes of stalling the massacre, but they could already smell the danger ahead and proceeded to flee. A combination of troops from France, Italy and Belgium emerged to evacuate their citizens. With the withdrawal of all foreign citizens and troops, the Rwandans were left to their fate and the United Nations failed them. 
Political leaders who tried to stop the killings were arrested and executed. Two weeks after Habari Mana's assassination, the Rwandan genocide was now full-blown. What made it more alarming was the systematic plotting and execution of the killings right from the ruling party downward. The brutal slaughtering of opposing tribe members was referred to as work, while weapons such as guns and machetes were referred to as tools. The killings were done under the guise of self-defense and the political leaders, as well as troops, aided the civilians in continuing the genocide. Provisions were made for rounding off the Tutsis for massacres and mass burying of the corpse. Properties and lands left behind by the dead were divided accordingly. Different strategies were employed by the planners of the genocide in ensuring that their goals were achieved. At some point, a campaign was launched disguised as pacification. This was only a ploy to lure Tutsis who had been hiding or had escaped the killings. Tutsi women were not spared as they were raped, tortured and then killed. Incentives in the form of food, drinks and money were offered to those willing to work and those unwilling to participate, that is, Hutus, were mocked and harassed. Amid these large-scale killings, Tutsis were forced to devise means of survival. Lives were saved in exchange for money or sexual favors. Thousands fled to neighboring countries while others hid in places unimaginable just to survive. Some were also invariably spared by Hutus who had families or friendship ties with them. This only served as proof that no sharp divisive line could be drawn between both tribes considering that they shared many things in common including children of mixed blood. On July 15, 1994, after about a hundred days of shared horror and ferocious killings, the Rwandan genocide ended and a new government was sworn in. The unspoken horrors and the bitter memories remained ingrained in the hearts of survivors. Colonel Theonest Bagosara, a major planner of the genocide with over 60 other indicted officials, was convicted and sentenced. Some groups believe that the Hutu extremists who were angered by Habyarimana's signing of the Arusha Accords carried out the assassination. There were also allegations that the RPF were behind the assassination. Investigations were launched in 1998 and presided over by Jean-Louis Bruguer, a well-known judge. The results pointed to the RPF and its leaders as being responsible for the assassination. The French government continued the investigations as crew members who had been killed with two presidents in a presidential private jet were French. By 2004, specific accusations about spearheading the assassination were laid on the RPF leader, Paul Kagame, who is now the president of Rwanda. Kagame denied the allegations and also initiated an investigative inquiry into the matter later on. In 2010, the RPF released its findings stating that the Hutu extremists were behind the killing. In general, these investigations negatively impacted Rwanda's relations with the French government. In 2018, 24 years after the 1994 assassination of Habyarimana, the last known set of investigations were dismissed on terms of insufficient evidence. The late president's widow, Agathe appealed to get the case reopened in 2020, but it was rejected. Rwanda's Kinani could not live up to his name, and the question of who killed Juvenal Habyarimana remains a mystery even to this day. We believe we have opened your eyes to something new. So, don't hesitate to like and share this video with your friends. You can subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to receive the latest videos as they drop. Also, don't miss our next video on how the United Nations failed Rwanda in 1994.